Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the subnetwork uh, on uh, e-learning and open education within the fifth edition of the Unimed Week that, as you know, this year is taking place uh, fully online and uh, we are uh, enjoying these uh, webinars as uh, genuine moments of uh, presentation and discussions. We have at the moment uh, 32 people connected uh, and uh, we, we expect to have uh, at least an hour, an hour and a half uh, of uh, knowledge sharing as we normally do in the, in the sub-network uh, on e-learning and open education. Uh, I will give you uh, three notes on the sub-network to start so we know the, the frame of this webinar and then uh, I will give the floor to our uh, in, in introductory speakers and to our speakers. So the sub-network uh, uh, on e-learning and open education has been created in uh, 2018 following uh, the pretty successful Open Med project that some of you remember <clears throat> and is now counting with 39 uh, universities from the UNIMED memberships uh, uh, coming from 18 countries. So it's one of the most, uh, I would say, one of the largest sub-networks within UNIMED. And uh, basically what it does uh, are three things. So knowledge sharing, like it's happening now. So people are telling their stories, others are listening and commenting and we are, we are learning from each other. We, we give support <clears throat> to the members in case a member needs something specific on a specific technological or pedagogical or innovation issue. We try to find expertise within the sub-network, so to facilitate also cross support. And of course, we try to give a visibility to what members do outside the sub-network and also outside the Unimed network. And an example is the, the online resilience web page that uh, we have created in order to collect stories about uh, what the universities are doing to fight uh, or to, to, to facilitate the change towards online teaching in the COVID time, actually. And as you can imagine, during the COVID emergency, the subnetwork has become even more relevant because everybody had to go online uh, typically in a weekend. So we, we started with this idea of collecting stories and uh, Christina had the great idea of calling them resilience stories. So this is not really innovation, it's really it's not just uh, emergency but it's uh, it's actually real resilience and the the coming to this webinar the the idea of this webinar and the objective is to move from this emergency uh, feeling we all perceived in the last couple of months even three months i would say towards a discussion on how to make this innovation sustainable and systemic because actually a lot of innovation has been uh, has come out during <clears throat> during the COVID days and months and now the challenge is actually not to go back to normal with more technology but actually to implement uh, the innovations that have proven to work during the emergency in a, in a sustainable way. And this is why we are here today and the, we have uh, four speakers that will uh, present their story, let's say, present uh, the, 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 the possibility to move from again emergency to to sustainable innovation from a personal, institutional, national, and collaborative perspective. So we try to give four different perspectives to, to, to the problem. And then uh, the idea is to have uh, these four presentations after an introduction that I will call in in a moment, and then to have a discussion moment uh, where we are gonna answer to uh, some questions that we have prepared. So I will now share the screen to show you the to show you the questions we have actually prepared for you. So that I think it is working. No, this is not a good one, sorry. Okay, here it is. So just a second, yes. Uh, so I'm sharing the questions with you. And uh, the, last, uh, the last point uh, is uh, to, I'm asking all the participants to use the chat for now, if you have questions or if you have already answers or uh, comments to the questions that we are posing, that we will be posing in the chat in the, in the slide in a moment. And then at the end, you will be able to request the floor to speak and to let us know actually how you uh, have uh, actually answered or tried to answer to these, uh, to these questions that are here. I hope you can see them now. <clears throat> So these are, it's coming in a second. 
These are the three questions, which, uh, so as you can see, we, we, the idea is to discuss, uh, first of all, the challenge you had, then uh, the learning ideas, and then uh, what are your e-learning strategic plans for the future, so how to make this innovation sustainable. But before starting all of this, uh, I have the pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Wail uh, Benjeloun, uh, Honorary President of UNIMED, for a short introduction of our webinar. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. It's a pleasure to see everyone. Uh, and I'm sure the discussions will be very interesting. Uh, the topic today is not a new topic for UNIMED. It's been around for uh, several years and it's, it goes well before, as you said, before the, uh, uh, the sub-network. It goes back to the open med, uh, uh, very important open med project that was managed by, uh, by UNIMED. Uh, what has happened in the last few months is not really a, the creation of new technology but it seems to me that it was technology that was there and people hesitated to use it. And I know that in the case, uh, for example, of Morocco, we have been pushing faculty to use uh, distance learning for many years now. And the, the, the conditions created by COVID now have made it possible, have pushed them into, uh, for, in a sense, forced them into uh, using the technology that was available. So faculty and staff, had to develop quickly competencies, and I'm sure Noel will talk about this, and students also have to gain some fluidity in dealing with the system. And as we can see through uh, the last few days uh, during this UNIMED week in Brussels, the technology is not always very cooperative, that sometimes we have problems, and you can imagine when these problems concern uh, the learning process and the ability of uh, a student to integrate and then be tested on material later, it's uh, it, the kinds of, of questions that it creates. To my mind, I think there are two issues, uh, and, you, and, and you've talked essentially about them in some way. One is the equity issue. The equity issue is that uh, we are somehow making the presumption that all students have access to this technology, and that's not true. And it's not true in the developing world. It's not true in the developed world, in the sense that, uh, Many, many uh, students, and in, in the US, it turns out that 3 million university students do not have access to uh, the technology to be able to, uh, to, to, do, uh, uh, to be able to do distance learning. At the same time, we have closed our campuses. So whatever technology was available to students on campus is now no longer available. And it has to be technology that has to be at home. And if you're in the rural areas, you can imagine the kinds of problems that we are creating. So the students being off campus is in and of itself a problem for uh, the use of the technology. Finally, there are some uh, indications that the private sector is moving in with, by making uh, technology freely available for a period of time. I think when we talk about uh, sustainability, governments have to look uh, as to how they can go in partnerships with this private sector to make sure that this kind of activity continues and that the right to information, and I repeat here, the right to information, which is a fundamental human right, can be exercised within the framework of access to information online. We know that uh, the degree of satisfaction from uh, uh, in, in surveys that were done in Morocco for secondary school, the degree of satisfaction is not always very high. Uh, we have uh, half of the faculty of the secondary school teachers that are satisfied, whereas only two out of 10 students are satisfied with the learning process in which they are engaged. 78% of teachers complain about connectivity, whereas 65% of students complain about uh, uh, connectivity. So within the next five years, and I'm, when we talk about sustainability, within the next five years, I think uh, non-permanent and remote workers will be expected to make about 40% of uh, the private sector employees. That tells you 
the importance of the work that we're engaged in now. What we are doing now is not only for education, but will also prepare our students to face the uh, changing conditions in the workplace in the future. So today's seminar and, and your contributions, all of the panelists' contributions are very important. Leadership is no longer going to be a vertical issue. It's going to be a, a matter of influence within networks of, uh, of people in, uh, in, uh, in internet, uh, internet uh, circles and connectivity. So the work you are doing today and the background and the uh, uh, information that we are garnering from uh, your experiences today are very important as to how we set up to face the future. Thank you very much. And I'm looking very forward very much to what I'm going to hear today. Thank you very much, Wail. Exactly. I mean, the two issues, equity and this, uh, these new partnerships between the uh, private sector and, and public sector, I think, are actually at the core of many discussions. And it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I also like very much the five years uh, um, perspective that you give, because when, you, when people talk about sustainability, sometimes we tend to talk about the infinite future, which means nothing. Or sometimes we think about tomorrow, which also means nothing. So I think a five-year term for our reflections is a, is a very good proposal. All right, so I'm now giving the floor to four speakers. So as I was saying before, we're going to hear from uh, Mahdi from Bethlehem University, the personal perspective. So uh, how a person, let's say, within an institution can really uh, drive the change and drive innovation. And that's going to be really an interesting story. Then we are going to be moving to the institutional level with the e-learning center by Kinatz, i from, uh, from Syria, and so on to the national level. And finally, we're from Finland, we're going to hear from uh, Vesa Korhonen from Tampere University on actually the, the second perspective that uh, Waile was putting forward, which is the partnership perspective, because individuals alone, institutions alone, and even governments alone cannot drive the change. We are sure that this is, uh, must be tackled uh, in, a, in a collaborative way. And so we, we specifically wanted to introduce the collaborative perspective uh, between institutions, among institutions uh, in, into the picture. So I'm asking uh, all the speakers to be brief uh, so that we can have some time also for you to answer to the questions at the, at the end of the, of the, of the of after the session. And uh, to the others, please use the chat for your questions and we will uh, take them uh, after every presentation. So I'm giving the floor to Mahdi Kleibo from uh, Bethlehem University. Uh, good morning, good evening, everyone. I hope that you can hear me clear. Uh, first, I would like to say a special thank you for, for your kind invitation to participate in this e-learning webinar with special thank for Mr. Well, for Mr. Ms. Christina, Fabio, Marcello for organizing the event. Uh, I'm going to work parallel, so most of the links that I would like to share with you, I will put it on the chat box to save time and to zoom in into the main areas that I would like to discuss. Uh, but as a start, I would like to compliment Mr. Rao what he has mentioned about the labor force and uh, there's uh, the restrictions of the mobility and the adaptation and to where are we moving forward uh, versus the labor force. It's a major issue everybody is talking and discussing. A uh, brief introduction about myself. My name is Mahdi Kleibo and I represent the External Academic Relations Erasmus ICM Virtual Exchange Program Coordinator and Facilitator at Bethlehem University. Uh, my main aim is to facilitate modernization, accessibility to internationalization and institutionalization through shifting current high education teaching method from a teach central approach to a virtual learner approach. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Bethlehem University quickly moved education online, rushing into increasingly quickly due to the change uh, brought by the emergency in terms of online teaching and virtual approaches in international mobility and cooperation. As a part of the process, I would like to share my experience with a, with a larger community with the aim of advanced shaping the transition from emergency to sustainable teaching and learning innovation in the Mediterranean, of course, region. As a result of attending the open online course, Euro-Mediterranean International Trends um, 
I successfully managed to move from the emergency online teaching to sustainable innovation e-learning at my home university. I highly recommend attending this course as you can be an active observer, influential, and partner of the international higher education future movement towards applying digitalized virtual exchange teaching, uh, training, coaching, and coaching. I posted my first article on the online resistance during the COVID-19 under the title Mobility COVID-19 uh, Restrictions, followed by a second article under the title Palestinian Employability Future Between Preventive and Corrective Challenges. I do ad admit that the style I endorsed was very technical to reach out to the biggest audience as I focused on tools that I relied for best efficient and effective practices. Um, not only it was feasible for my home university based on the collective feedback that I received, it was good shared uh, practices on the national and international dissemination scale. Uh, in August uh, edition uh, 2020, I will publish another article for the hospitality employability future between preventive and corrective challenges with special focus on three main areas, international networks, um, negativity impacted by workforce balance, and I will talk more about digitalization. To summarize, what we truly need now is to apply 21st century good practices. I believe the uh, post-crisis world will be more in-depth, less global, and more digital, and to improve the quality of higher education and professional management, and to strengthen the importance of education for the future labor market challenges. There is a true need to strengthen of the international between higher education companies, local, national, and uh, regional authorities in, is required. Higher education need to take into consideration modernization, virtual accessibility, and best practices of internationalization as a tool to improve employability in the region, with a collective collaboration to set a plan to improve and strengthen the role and potential of the development of employability by adapting to transversal inter, um, interpersonal dialogue between local and international universities, companies, and decision makers. This means uh, we further need to discuss together on how to move from emergency to sustainable innovation in online learning and to continue advocating an open and permanent dialogue on employability and support the realization of the new wave of practical business recruitment experiences in the context of education, training, and youth workforce. This is an invitation to embrace, or embrace the opportunity uh, in front of us today. We can truly redefine who we are as proactive and creative virtual community. We have an important role to play to create a new, uh, even stronger culture of learning. Uh, we don't have all the answers for now, but we do all, uh, but we are all on this journey together. And I look forward to learning more about stories presented by my colleagues from Syria, Morocco, and Finland, and other respectful partners. But once again, I would like to enforce that the labor force is our aim. And whatever we are moving towards at higher education using the technology, it should be focused on what are the expectations of the labor force, because we are qualifying our students to work forward, qualifying them to find job opportunities. So uh, maybe it's, uh, it's really worth to go into, the, into depth into that dialogue and to see how can we all cooperate and collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahdi. This, was, uh, this was actually a very nice uh, and, and actually short uh, set of points. Uh, I, I personally fully agree on this, uh, on this need to continue the dialogue and to do this in an open way. And we have some ideas with Christine and Marcello that we will share at the end, but we keep it as a surprise. But thank you for anticipating that. That's uh, very good. And uh, it's it's interesting how you you how you are how you are underlying the, the need to connect uh, with the new needs of the labor market because uh, as Wail was saying, labor market is going to change, society is going to change, and the change will stay. And actually, there is a risk to be a bit self-referential in looking only at how education must change, not at how education must change for other changes like the one of the labor market. So I think it's a it's a very good point and uh, it's, it's taken also for the for the broader discussion 
There was a question for you about uh, the open online course uh, that you mentioned at the very beginning, the course on intercultural trends, uh, Euro-Mediterranean intercultural trends. We will put the link uh, in a moment in the chat. That was a course, it's a course uh, uh, by the Annalyn Foundation uh, in collaboration with UNIMED, uh, which uh, we had the pleasure to, to support. Uh, that is the, exactly, that is the link. Thank you. And uh, so I, I agree with you. It's a good suggestion uh, to, to explore that course also because of its leadership and, and change dynamics. I have another question for you uh, from Mohammed. Uh, how can you convince students uh, to get involved in involved in e-learning? So that's about the student resistance. What's your, what's your secret there? Can I answer? May I answer? Please, please. That, that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to say something that the home university has to be convinced to support the people at front to answer this question. Uh, the student is a person who receives the service. He is expecting or she's expecting that there's a system that supports to move this student from one place to a better place. When there is cracks in the system by the higher education and they don't have the full picture and they don't have the capacity and they don't have the tools, the students can sense that there's something wrong. So I would say, and I would highly recommend that reinforce yourself from inside and as a result, the students has the full power to acknowledge and to know exactly to where he's heading. Um, so it has to do with the system, organizing yourself internally, prepare yourself, make everything very transparent and show that you know what you are doing. The students once realizes that he is part of a big map, well organized and his role is very clear and defined he will be a partner of your journey. Otherwise, the resistance is very normal. But once again, we are having this problem of resistance nowadays in my home country and most probably in other countries. Uh, the resistance is natural. And the only answer to cure this answer is uh, be prepared, uh, show a lot of material, do a lot of virtual uh, training seminars, webinars, discussions, open discussions. In my particular situation, I would say in, in Palestine, the students, they do not have the authority to pick their own topics. They would like to discuss, they would like to learn at higher education, it's the parents. I would save time into addressing the parents because they are the people who make the decision on behalf of their children once they move from high school to higher education. So the message would be enforced and directed towards the parents because they are the decision makers. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, that's more, more than a trick. Actually, it's a very, very complete uh, understanding of the issue. And thank you also for sharing the links uh, in the chat. I am advising everybody to have a look at the chat, especially the, the last one you shared about Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange. It is, again, a way to open up the minds of students, not only to intercultural collaboration, but also to the use of technology for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very useful um, points. Okay, so we are now moving from the individual, actually it's more than individual, but from a professor's uh, perspective to the institutional perspective. And I'm now calling in uh, Kinatz uh, Atouni from Syria. Uh, you are working and leading the e-learning center so of your university. We know that e-learning centers have been, uh, um, let's say, charged with a lot of responsibility in this period. And so please go on and let us uh, let us know your story. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the head of quality and accreditation department. As you know, all Syrian universities, uh, the accredited pedagogy has been entirely conventional learning. Uh, and we didn't have any basis for online learning, uh, learning management systems, and digital platform. Moreover, as you know, uh, Syrian is suffering from a sanction right now. So uh, technology uh, like uh, Google uh, Class, like Zoom, we cannot use it. Uh, now I'm using the private uh, network, private key network to, to uh, participate uh, with this uh, webinar and maybe at any time, uh, will be uh, 
the internet uh, not stable and uh, disabled. Uh, even so, uh, our university took uh, the decision that uh, they, uh, they, they want to go towards blended learning. What we did, uh, first of all, during the COVID-19, uh, we go through three phases. The first, uh, the first phase, just record the sessions uh, are were uploaded to students and uh, without uh, interactions, uh, teacher student interaction. And the second phase uh, were to uh, introduce forum for students, uh, case study, chatting. Uh, we created the uh, learning management system using uh, Moodle as an open source. And the third one, we use open, uh, open plugin, which is the big blue button, to launch uh, virtual classes. Uh, of course, to sustain what we uh, have done, uh, uh, we launch uh, a center of teaching learning, uh, and we use uh, some uh, open source uh, digital tools, because we cannot uh, use uh, the normal one. And uh, now we are uh, training our teachers uh, uh, through virtual uh, training and face-to-face uh, -face learning, face-to-face uh, -face training uh, to how to uh, design uh, the courses to be online. Of course, our experience is very uh, soft and, uh, uh, and humble. Thank you very much. Well, actually, your experience seems much more than uh, than soft and humble. Actually, and it's uh, it's uh, this uh, this idea of uh, I don't want to say frugal innovation, but very bottom up innovation, also connected to the limitation in terms of tools. We always say in the learning world that tools are not uh, the focus and tools are not important. But actually, when you are limited in the in, in the tools you can use they sort of become important and they might become a, a source of exclusion. Um, everybody, please put questions for um, Kinat in the, in the chat. I, I have one for you, since you are representing a teaching and learning or any learning center. Uh, how, how did it feel when uh, from uh, one day to the other, somebody came to you and said, we need to go online. University is closed and now you lead. How do we do this? So what was the, the first reaction and the main uh, internal challenges? How did it work? I think going uh, uh, online totally, it is impossible. Maybe uh, just using uh, online as a coursework. Uh, maybe using uh, technology to enhance uh, teaching and learning. But going totally online uh, through these circumstances, it's uh, impossible. Syria, I think, uh, particularly the five years, the next five years. This is my own impression, yeah. my own expectations. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question for you by Ahmad. Uh, what do you think of the experience of the virtual university in Syria? I think this is uh, the question was. Sorry? Uh, please, the question is, uh, what do you think of the experience of the virtual university in Syria? Uh, as a Syrian university or as a, an Arab international university? Uh, um, because if as a Syrian university, um, we don't really have uh, a good experience. Uh, students' uh, lack of uh, access to internet, the speed of internet, cutting electricity, But uh, as an Arab international university, I think it's uh, better because we made our own uh, tools. We rely on open source, open resources. And uh, uh, we try to offer uh, some facilities to our students. Okay. Be because we are a private university, maybe for this reason. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Kinat. It's very interesting to get the Syrian perspective, actually. And uh, thank you twice for being here with this insight. And actually, uh, we have been also collaborating. One thing I forgot to say before is that 
the subnetwork we are we are uh, that is convening the meeting today is also working through some projects supported by the commission, including the DG Health project where we are working together and other projects like Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, which was mentioned by Madi, or Jovital in, 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 in Jordan or Valeux in Albania. So we have different projects. And actually, every time you see an opportunity to promote a project you know or you are aware of through the subnetwork, please do it. Because every time this happens, it's a plus. So we, we have noticed that uh, whether in, uh, in meetings or in, in uh, just promoting the results of a project, uh, the subnetwork is really working well because we are reaching people who have a vested interest actually in e learning and open education. So thank you. And actually the, the training we did, uh, for example, in DG Health was blended, as you say, it was not fully. Yes. <laughs> that confirms what you were saying. Thank you very much. We, we are now moving to the national dimension. Uh, we had already an anticipation uh, on the importance of what we're talking about for Morocco by Wail. But now I would like to call in uh, Nawal from uh, University Mohamed Senk Rabat to get uh, a, a perspective on the, from the national level, <coughs> happening uh, as much as possible in the national okay. level. Hello, everyone. Happy to see you, Professor Wael, and to meet you online. Thank you very much, Christina and Fabio, for organizing this uh, webinar and inviting me uh, to participate. Uh, in the current health circumstances of COVID-19 pandemic, the Moroccan Ministry of National Education announced the suspension of courses in classrooms at all schools and universities since the 16th of March of this year. This procedure is one of to control and stop the spread of the contamination. Adapting to this new reality, all existing courses are made online for all students from primary to higher education. I'm going to talk on how online education in schools was during the pandemic what was the strategy in Morocco before the pandemic to digitalize education and what was the measures held by the University of Mohammed V at the beginning of the pandemic. So for students from primary to high school, a national platform named Telmitis was updated regularly. Students have access without using password and without having an internet account. Lessons are grouped by subject, level, and branch of study. In addition, uh, dedicated national channels like Rabia, and others broadcast students' programs according to a schedule announced for each level and every subject. Every week, uh, the program and replays on TV are launched. In addition to that, many other helpless families in rural areas have received devices to be able to take online courses thanks to the foundations like UNICEF, UNESCO, ICESCO, and others. They provide up to uh, 100,000 devices. This number, unfortunately, does not cover all the needs. Uh, now I'll, I'll go to, I'll talk about uh, high, higher uh, education in Morocco. Um, we did not switch uh, to distance education based on no experience. There has been distance learning years before. In the accreditation of a program, it mentioned that it is requested to teach in e-learning mode, besides the teaching and attendance. Tutors are rewards in their evaluation progress grades when an e-learning content is developed. So referring to the 2015-2030 strategic vision of the High Council for Education, training and scientific research, the ministry launched a project entitled uh, GENI, which is the acronym for Generalization of the Use of New Information Technologies and Communication in the Field of High Education. The objectives of the strategy is to involve teachers in integrating ICT, information and communication technology in teaching, improving the quality of teaching and programming trainings, 
Based on these objectives, there are two expected results. Uh, first, to develop a mutual platform for uh, distance education within universities and to create a national virtual university. The former means the national platform MUN. Uh, you can access to it uh, from MUN.ma. Uh, is functional as in 2017, there was a call for projects which counted 49 approved MOOCs projects. In the current pandemic situation, the MOOCs on the national platform have served the teachers to reopen their course to students. It was only necessary to do tutoring and to moderate online. Normally, all Moroccan universities have their own e-learning center to support and assist teachers. Let's take the example of uh, Mohammed V University and state some statistics. The e-learning center of the university was created in 2002. It is equipped with a recording studio and all dedicated technical software and hardware uh, necessary for editing and assembling an e-content. Referring to the Digital Learning Center website, uh, Google Classroom counts 13,000 subscribes, uh, 8,060 students, 135 classes, and 58 teachers. Whereas Moodle and OpenEdX MOOC count um, 1,222 subscribes, 66 courses and 31 teachers that, that, that uh, are active. Once the ministry announced the closure of universities and schools um, of the two sectors, private and public, the university uh, took urgent and fast measures as some courses of human science that were broadcast on the TV automatically all students and teachers who haven't uh, Microsoft Teams account receive the details to access to theirs. Teachers who wish to have an account on Moodle or Classroom could request uh, one by email. From the first week of the pandemic, platforms users guide in document and video format were sent, shared by email and were at everyone's disposal via the, the university website. Uh, this is, was the first week. After that second week, uh, the university was able to host 12,000 simple educational resources on the university's platform, according to the interview with the, the president of the university. Uh, the interview was held in uh, 29 uh, of May of this year. A uh, database for common questions and answers has been created to advise and guide students. Another measure is that recently a form was sent to teachers and students to assess distance learning. The results obtained are 70% satisfaction was expressed by the 9,000 responses from students and 75% of satisfaction uh, by teachers. Also, uh, to strengthen the online learning, the Ministry has signed a partnership with the British Council to offer free online resources to students. All the stakeholders are engaged since it's the only way uh, to ensure the continuity of the learning programs and everyone's safety at the same time. So all are aware of the importance of this mode of teaching and agree on the fact that blended learning is the best way to improve quality of education and to benefit from the various advantages each mode offers. So um, I'm brief, I didn't want to be uh, to take uh, more uh, time. I didn't uh, state every everything the ministry did but i chose the most important just to share with you uh, so welcome for any questions well, actually i think you shared a lot and it's impressive to see how many how many things uh, the the government did actually there it's uh, a lot a lot really we we are all aware of uh, their active uh, uh, yeah. procedures 
Great. So I'm asking everybody to put questions in the chat. And in the meantime, I have one uh, regarding your presentation. I don't know if maybe also, Wail, uh, you want to, to intervene on that. I have the feeling that, uh, I mean, you are into a, um, the, the subnetwork is on e-learning and open education. So open education is a big concern. And you mentioned the, the MOOC platform, uh, Moon, uh, which is actually based uh, on, on a on an open approach, uh, and yeah. also the fact that, for example, the, the national platform uh, was available without registration. So there is a lot of openness uh, in, in, the, in the action of the government. On the other hand, you, you are saying that uh, they have Microsoft and the big private players that, as Marty was saying before, are opening up some of their services now and their content, but who knows what will happen in the future. So these might are seen by somebody also as a marketing activities in a, in, in a delicate moment. So what is your feeling? Do you think that uh, this emergency will give a, a, no, a push towards openness of resources, of tools, of approaches, or will be, as some people are also saying, will have a, a bounce back effect to go back to proprietary approaches? What is your... Uh, uh, yeah, that's for sure. This is very a big push to uh, to really understand the the advantages that offer the online course uh, and the online learning, but also to understand what we are doing uh, in attendancy. I mean, the complementary of both modes are very essential to to have the best quality of education, and um, all of, all teachers. Um, like uh, are now uh, understand this and uh, have had no choice during this pandemic and um, and touch this uh, importance and i i can assure you that they understand now how how they will gain after uh, doing or after preparing their course online after that uh, it's gonna be much better to to teach much better to um, to um, uh, I mean uh, uh, to send these uh, ideas and uh, uh, to achieve objectives uh, with the students. That's uh, great. I don't know if uh, Wail, you want to comment uh, as a luxury Moroccan observer of the um, of the situation on this dichotomy between open and closed because of course both things are present but uh, a push will come in one direction and uh, I, I like very much the, the the optimistic view by Noel and I mean and I share it to a certain extent what's your view Wail? I think what's um, uh, what's very clear now is that the market has increased uh, the use has increased, and not only in Morocco, I think across the world, the market has increased, and there's going to be pressure moving forward to keep the market open so that uh, those who are making money off of, uh, uh, off of service provisions and so forth will have to find other ways to tap into uh, the uh, uh, available, available wealth, if I can say it that way, rather than just the opening up of, uh, uh, of, of, their, of their networks through subscriptions. So my, and it's only a feeling, I'm not, uh, of course, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying uh, anything for, uh, that for certain, but my feeling is that the market will stay open so that access to information will stay open. Uh, they will find other ways to make us pay. Okay, good, good. Uh -huh. It's still optimistic, but with a drop of realism more, I think it's, uh, we are, actually it's, uh, I mean, it's possibly the, the direction to go. We have a, actually a question coming from a couple of persons on assessment, which is a, an issue all around the globe. And the question is, how are you dealing with assessment? Uh, is this, are you yeah. using online assessment or? Yeah, actually, recently we, um we have uh, it's it's um, there there is two uh, two approaches uh, uh, there are um, open access uh, universities uh, where the decision uh, made is to to evaluate uh, until september uh, but for other other universities or schools uh, that have a limited number i'm talking about higher education okay 
So um, for schools that have a limited number, um, they decided to, to make assessments online. So we have to prepare for this month, for uh, June and July, uh, assessments online. And each professor is um, uh, choosing the way he wants to do it, uh, whether using a platform like Moodle for um, programming uh, time uh, snap time uh, or a number of uh, attempts or doing it uh, online, I mean, face to face, uh, preparing a bank of questions and asking the student directly, seeing him uh, on video and asking questions and directly giving the, the grade uh, of each one. Uh, so it depends on, on each university and school. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe this question can also be discussed, I guess, among the challenges uh, in the this is the, during the pandemic, but after that, there are many other ways to, to make uh, the assessments. There are formative uh, assessments, there are summative assessments. So, um, ideally, um, which is a better way to, to assess, is to prepare uh, on a platform so we can have this um, uh, an evaluation after that on the, the progress of students. Perfect, absolutely. Thank you very much. We have a comment. Uh, we have to attend the France experience of assessment. So, this, uh, so to look at, uh, at the experience of France, right? If I understand well, Professor Benaziza. I think, uh, yeah, I think the comment is to we, have to, we have to attend France or to look at France experience of assessment uh, as, a, as a suggestion. Thank you very much. All right, we are quite good with the timing. As you see, I'm taking the questions after the presentation uh, to allow some interactivity, but please, if you have some more general question, be ready also to speak out in a moment. I'm now giving the floor to our last speaker coming from Europe. We are, of course, a Euro, -Mediter Euro South Mediterranean network sub network so we have uh, one of our new members actually i forgot at the beginning to welcome the new members uh, we have some new members in the in the in the sub network on e learning and open education one of these uh, some of them are are uh, actually participating i think i've seen for example the university of salento earlier and another one is the tampere university from finland and uh, and let's try to tackle with this intervention the dimension of partnership. So from the individual to the national to the um, partnership dimension. So how to face the change and how the changes happened from a partnership perspective. So I'm giving the floor to Vesa Korhonen from Tampere University. I hope I pronounced it well. Okay, thank you. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen? I have a few slides to show. Absolutely. So uh, it might be a little bit easier to follow. So let me stop my sharing. Okay. Let's see. Unfortunately, it says here that the host disabled participant screen sharing so i cannot do do that unfortunately maybe maybe christina should uh, allow hold on hold on yes uh, let please do it now try to do it now okay now it should work we are all getting so, upset with roles you uh, know with uh, whether you are a panelist or a presenter, yeah. Well, it is uh, loading. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to present some experiences of this e-training FinPo project. And uh, uh, I'm coming from, from Finland and Tampere University, uh, who is a member now in this Unimed network. and. Uh, and uh, I have been working as a research director uh, three years now in this uh, e-training FinPAL project. Uh, and I created this kind of title for this presentation. Uh, 
it is uh, mainly a partnership uh, program between uh, one Finnish and one Palestinian higher education institution. And uh, here you see also the names of our project group. Four members uh, from our university have been uh, participating in this project. So basically this, this has taken uh, um, about 20% uh, uh, work share of my work duties uh, during the last three years when, when uh, supervising this pro program. And this program uh, has been mainly about uh, uh, developing an online training program for, uh, for, for uh, academic staff at uh, uh, Gaza Islamic University in, in Gaza Strip area in, in Palestine. And uh, aim has, has to be also the wider aim to strengthen the pedagogical competencies of, of academic te teaching staff in, in, that, uh, in that university. And uh, in fact, uh, we, uh, we first implemented this uh, online training program uh, uh, as a uh, blended learning program way. And it's uh, basically the same, same uh, training program uh, called teaching and learning in higher education, what we have uh, also implementing for our own staff here in, in uh, Tampere University in a in face-to-face uh, way. And, but uh, for this uh, project, uh, we, we uh, developed it uh, to be more as an online, online program. And uh, first, this online uh, program was uh, targeted for uh, training of trainers uh, at IUG and uh, the next phase is uh, local trainings uh, were organized for local teaching staff uh, at IUG. Uh, in fact, two, two uh, local training rounds uh, were implemented in, in later phase at IUG. And uh, core of this online training program, uh, what we first implemented, it is a blended learning uh, kind of uh, delivery, which consists of uh, uh, five uh, intensive seminar days, uh, ma mainly uh, online, uh, three, three, uh, 10 webinars, and also uh, individual and group assignments and uh, and uh, here you see also the themes what this program consisted of and uh, this blended learning was uh, organized with with help of Moodle and uh, video conferencing uh, software with at that time uh, at year 2018 was uh, mainly Adobe Connect in our university but now afterwards it, 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 has, it has been uh, uh, more used to, for example, Teams and Zoom kind of uh, video conferencing programs. Skype was also utilized quite much uh, in, the, in the, this program because it was uh, maybe the most familiar uh, uh, video conferencing uh, software with local uh, users at IOC. And also WhatsApp was uh, used to support uh, uh, local uh, local uh, participants uh, to, to get in, in touch with participants and uh, get uh, some some uh, uh, in, important uh, instant uh, information for them so it's a combination of different kind of synchronous and asynchronous kind of uh, collaboration uh, modes in, in online and here's an uh, capture of the uh, uh, one um, video conference session where, where uh, in fact there was a local uh, training group because uh, some of the Palestinian participants uh, had a chance to travel also to Finland uh, to participate in into this um, uh, for example in this kick of a seminar where this uh, training program started and and rest of the participants were locally participating at IUG 
and uh, and uh, that's how we could get this um, whole whole program started. Uh, but here is the main um, social network and collaboration scheme for this kind of uh, partnership. Although it's a, a institutional cooperation, uh, the main main activities are of course uh, implemented by by people participating in this program. So we uh, four members at uh, Tampere University uh, coordinated and, and supported the program. Uh, there were four core team members participating at IUG, and uh, they were. Uh, uh, organizing uh, the local activities. Academic Excellence Unit was established during the program uh, at IUG for supporting uh, the academic staff training development and also some uh, technological resources were uh, possible to, uh, to uh, established during a pro program like computer classroom uh, with 25 laptops and uh, studio classroom locally for recording video materials and so on. So, so the project have uh, had that kind of outcomes as well. And uh, the trained trainers uh, during the first uh, online training round, there were 16 participants originally and nine of them uh, continued to be as uh, trainers for others locally and uh, and uh, in the second phase uh, trainings locally uh, uh, there were uh, 127 participants at IUC and elsewhere in, in the Gaza Strip area higher education institutions who, who participated in the local training rounds. Local training rounds were, were mainly face-to-face um, uh, -face, uh, trainings and uh, those were organized uh, in a much more shorter time period, uh, main, mainly within uh, four or six weeks while our first online training program uh, lasted uh, five months because it was uh, aside uh, other working duty, duties where these uh, trained trainers participating participated in our training program but this is a main scheme how this uh, collaboration uh, went on and uh, uh, and what kind of activities there were also for supporting uh, local training development at IUG that we organized uh, online workshops uh, uh, for supporting the training planning and also uh, we organized assessment workshops uh, in Finland where, where uh, those uh, Palestinian team members could uh, participate uh, here uh, last autumn when, when uh, we were also uh, evaluating the uh, activities uh, at that point. And, uh, in the last uh, slides, slide there are some some experiences of this. Uh, especially, these experiences are um, covering these kind of uh, issues with the with the online training program. What we we organized, of, of course, it it was um, offering a possibility uh, to local participants to participate into the training program. Uh, aside their other work duties and uh, they didn't have to travel for the training and it was quite a, a cheap uh, kind of uh, way of, of organizing uh, the training but of course there are, there were different challenges when, when uh, thinking about uh, how this uh, kind of training could be localized uh, into local training use. Of course, uh, there was a, so, some important side effect. Even though the program did not focus primarily on developing uh, online teaching, the nature of this kind of cooperation and the experiences in, in the local uh, uh, 
of, of the online training program and what we implemented. Uh, these led towards the uh, digital solutions uh, and understanding of digital solutions in teaching, which provided the be highly relevant uh, shift to online courses during the pandemic, especially in in, in, in Palestine area and, and at IUG, because uh, uh, some of the participants also reported when we did uh, some some uh, data collection uh, 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 during this pandemic uh, uh, pandemic time. Uh, now during spring, that uh, they have been uh, able to. Uh, shift quite flexibly to the uh, online teaching because uh, of these uh, experiences that they already uh, acquired during this this uh, program. So so this uh, proved to be a very important uh, result uh, of this uh, project uh, when thinking about the, uh, the ability of of, of uh, participants to, to reflect their, their possibilities to change the online teaching. So uh, these are the main notions uh, now. So maybe I, I stop sharing now and, uh, and uh, I can also uh, send you a link to our project website. There you can find uh, a lot of more information. So. I sent the link now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Vesa, for this uh, the reporting on, on this experience. Actually, it's, uh, I would say it's pretty, um, I mean, I, I like very much, uh, in the meantime, I'm again asking everybody if you have questions, please to use the chat. I like very much uh, in your challenges and benefits table that on the one hand, you were saying that um, potential increased accessibility but on the other side you had a lot of if so actually the real equity then the equity issue that uh, Wail was bringing into the game of course potentially everything could get more open and more accessible with technology but then when you look at uh, the cultural differences and the, the differences in terms of even devices and the limitation and so on it's uh, it's not always so there is we're always into this dynamic uh, between what could be achieved and what is being achieved in a number of cases and what is actually, um, what, what is missing to, to get there. And actually this, uh, uh, I don't know if somebody else from the speakers wants to comment on this nice experience uh, of the Finnish-Palestinian cooperation while I'm putting on the slides. Let me see if I can make it. Here it is. So I'm putting on the slide with uh, the, the three questions that we would like to address. Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm now calling also for uh, others than our speakers, other participants, uh, if you want to help us actually, uh, here we go, help us answering these questions. So this, this webinar, <clears throat> the idea of getting these uh, narratives uh, from uh, from our speakers was to complement what we, what we got uh, through the resilience website that I'm showing you here. This online resilience uh, collection of online learning stories, and you can see the website down there. So the idea of today's webinar is to complement the knowledge that we have already up uploaded there, as Mahdi was saying before, and uh, then uh, to to see how we can bring this forward and to keep the discussion alive, not only by collecting knowledge, but also by, by trying to analyze and transform it a bit. And we have come out with these three questions that uh, have already been tackled by most of you during your presentations. So um, the, the first one has to do with what was the major e-learning challenge that you had to overcome during the COVID emergency? And we heard about a number of them. Uh, in, your, in the presentations, what were the new ideas and practices connected to learning that were introduced during the emergency? So how has emergency contributed to innovative thinking? And what are your e-learning strategic plans for the future? So how are these new ideas getting transformed into, into strategic plans? 
Um, I am first asking to the speakers if you want to pick up on some of these questions uh, from what we have already presented and also to the other participants if you want to raise your hand and uh, we can give you the floor. So first to, to the speakers if you want to comment on some of these questions or challenges, new practices and new ideas and the transformation of these into future uh, plans or future sustainable innovations. Okay, can I start? Uh, Please, no one. Martin? Okay, so um, regarding the first question on the major challenges, um, I personally have one. Uh, I experienced it during this pandemic. Um, when I had to prepare for a new course, um, there, was no time, there was no time to restructure and segment the content and recall myself to the learners uh, so they can uh, visualize the, uh, the record, recordings uh, according to their rhythm. Uh, so to overcome that, I opt for a uh, synchronous mode. Uh, and what, uh, the, what I uh, introduced uh, as the idea to, to better have interaction is um, uh, in the content, I, um, I, I, uh, I put some breaks for reflection after each specific objective where learners had to discuss. Then I noticed, uh, I noticed immediately uh, what was missed and what was clear. So the focus on the objective was uh, mandatory. Um, and another point uh, is that I introduced some other videos from YouTube that gives concrete example, examples of what I explained. I looked as a complement of the course, some interactive exercise. Uh, where uh, the objective at the end was to explain the process uh, of an algorithm because uh, my uh, specialty is computer science and the course I had to prepare uh, from scratch was uh, intelligence artificial and for example as an interactive exercise I had to look for um, how to really understand deep learning and um, I looked for IBM experience and I, I gave it to, to the students. They liked very much. And from time to time, I, uh, I look for uh, short uh, YouTube videos, uh, two minutes, not more, uh, just to show them uh, examples of robots, how they, uh, how, how they, uh, they are used in China to overcome the, this, uh, um, this situation. Uh, so for, um, I'm going to, to answer to all questions at the same time, if you don't mind. So for the last question regarding the strategic plan, I'm, to, um, I'm answering uh, really personal, uh, personally, I'm going to start by preparing the script and restructuring it uh, and making the necessary records. Uh, and preparing formative and uh, summative assessments to put it on the on the platform. Um, and since I work on the digitalization of education using the intelligence artificial techniques as a research field, I'm willing to keep on really because there are much more to do um, to develop uh, to develop and to add to the existing platforms. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> sorry, sorry, I just wanted to, to stress your point about research that we haven't tackled on this, but actually the, the research field of learning is also booming at the moment. So we have a lot of production, especially also connected to the AI field. So thank you very much for mentioning this as a, as a possible future line, but of course. Yeah, you... there are many things to do. Uh, like for example, we have an issue online is to uh, how to, to be sure that the, the students or the learner uh, in front of the screen is doing, uh, is doing the assessments and how to, uh, to identify um, this, uh, this learner. So there is a visual, uh, visual intelligence or uh, um, the computer vision 
which is a subfield of uh, intelligence artificial. And once it is uh, as a model um, within the platform is integrated, we can have this uh, identity easily, for example. We have much more, we have augmented reality, we have um, much more uh, area we can, we can develop to overcome some problems in online uh, learning or to enhance or to improve this quality of online education. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else wants to comment on this uh, relation between challenge innovations and uh, system level? I've seen that Mahdi, you are commenting in the chat. You are a very fast writer. It's impressive the way you are putting down your thoughts. Congratulations for that. So it remains also visible for everybody. Mahdi, I don't know if you want to comment also something by voice. Feel free to do it. Eh? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, there's only one thing that I would like to summarize with all the learning I received. Um, eventually, e-learning is a tool. It's just a tool. You need to be qualified to use this tool and to customize it based on what you feel that it's most appropriate to present your, your service. Uh, what I see randomly is that people, they are focusing on the tool and they are neglecting the person behind the tool and how he's using or misusing those tools. So I would highly recommend everyone to get more engaged to the online learning that is presented by Unimed and by Erasmus Plus, because there's something called the culture of using the technology. You need to be trained to know how to use it and to use it efficiently and effectively. It will need, need time to, to know your skin and to know how to dress it and to pre present it people who receive can easily sense if you are natural or you're just using tools and just forcing them into the mouth of someone. And eventually uh, you don't want the bad negative impact of uh, misusing those tools. It's a language that a person needs to, to get learned, to learn it from really professional people. And now we do have this opportunity to learn it from the best people in that domain. So I hope everybody do take this opportunity really seriously. It's the culture. And one last thing that I would like to say once uh, to just wrap everything, we need to learn how to customize the service. We're transforming from a physical, uh, giving the service to virtual, which is a completely different culture, different language, different tools. But we need also to remember that we do have a competitive edge to compete, which is how to customize the service to attract more audience to willingly attend those services that we are providing. So customization, it should be on our checklist menu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important point, especially again, connecting to the, the role of the private sector, because I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's clear that uh, Governments and institutions can do any, anything they want, but it's all, it would always be difficult to win the battle against the, the giant, the private giants, if we are not able to, to change something in the people mindset and to prepare for this shift. Yes, very, very good. Anybody else from the panel and uh, wanting to take this, uh, the $1 million question, how make it sustainable, all the innovations that have popped up uh, during the emergency? Of course, when you are in emergency, you are more, uh, brave than normally, no? Because in emergency, everything is allowed, but then when you need to, to put that in a budget for next five years, you think twice. I don't know if we have some uh, comments also from the other participants. Uh, feel free to, I've seen some, uh, some, uh, some notes in the chat. Uh, I'm quickly reading them, uh, uh, so to allow everybody to, to see, to, to, to hear them. So Kinazzi is confirming that the, the, the highest challenge were students, students, and students teacher limited interaction and how to design the course for online. So how to be able to, to design proper online courses that can substitute the ones offline. That's a big issue, of course, also connected to personalization, of course. And then Yasmin is commenting that one of the challenges is that not all learners have the tech gadgets, especially if the learners are more than one students 
in the same family. And this is true, not only in, uh, in, in, uh, in the South Med, but it is an issue also, for example, in Italy, you've seen that having computers to follow some, uh, some lessons is sometimes not easy also for students in, let's say, so-called richer countries. So it's a very good point. If, if I may add something, uh, maybe uh, one thing, uh, how, to, uh, how to support uh, uh, teachers coping with uh, e-learning challenges might be uh, to support their collaboration. Because, uh, for example, in, in my own faculty, there has been that kind of uh, that kind of uh, uh, weekly weekly meetings, uh, team meetings uh, online, where uh, teachers have shared their experiences and good practices for uh, developing uh, online teaching, and that was also one core idea in our uh, Finnpal project, the uh, online training program in the first round that uh, we, we tried to uh, emphasize the, the collaboration between teachers, that uh, uh, you often think about uh, teaching uh, activities uh, as an independent autonomous work, but uh, you don't have to uh, necessarily invent the wheel again by yourself you hear uh, what others have done and uh, how they have solved uh, certain kind of problems related to uh, uh, online teaching challenges. So, so why not sharing these kind of good practices with, with each other? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, the, the sharing issue is also the core of our work in the subnetto, but it's not, uh, it doesn't come easily. You're right. It's, uh, you need some more to, to get there. We have a request from, uh, to talk from uh, Khalid Kamfar from uh, uh, Palestinian Technical University. I think you can speak now, Khalid. Khalid. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, how are you doing? Very well. Uh, good, good. Hello, everybody. Well, uh, in addition to the uh, readiness of all parties, including uh, students, uh, teachers, and families uh, for the e-learning, our main problem we faced is the virtual lapse. And all other problems we, can, we, we had managed uh, through uh, training programs, through awareness, through but uh, the main problem was for us as a technical uh, uh, university is the virtual labs. And the virtual labs are so expensive. Uh, we tried to buy some virtual labs and they were very, very expensive. So I would recommend uh, if there is a project uh, 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 from uh, Unimed, to, uh, to develop specifically virtual labs for the courses at the higher education. So this is our main problem. The others, we managed to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, for technical university, that's an issue. And in the past, many, many European projects on the side of research have tried to develop uh, virt open virtual labs, so it's accessible for free, but as far as I know, the commercial ones, uh, and as you say, quite expensive, are the ones that are still uh, the ones working better. But it's a, it's, a, it's taken as a note. I don't know if uh, somebody wants wants to comment on this. It's a, it's a difficult issue because these things are pretty. Nawal, you are. Yes, saying? I want to add something. Uh, I know that there are some projects that uh, Erasmus projects like uh, Experis, if I don't, uh, if I remember. Uh, and they, the, the objective is to create virtual uh, labs. Uh, it's an issue that uh, face many other fields. Um, I mean, not only uh, in computer science, but also in chemistry, 
um, in mechanics uh, and so on. So I think it's uh, better to, it's an idea. I don't know if it's uh, gonna work, but uh, it's um, to, involve, uh, to involve developers uh, and uh, to, to give the, um, the opportunity um, like these projects nationally or interna internationally to work on, on these labs and to make it open for a reuse because I think um, courses generally are, uh, I think, are not exactly the same, but um, have many things in common. So it might be a good thing, whether uh, better than um, looking for buying buying labs. It's gonna be it's gonna cost a lot. This is my point on uh, on labs. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's a big issue that uh, that we faced uh, during this uh, this pandemic, um, and doing it online, I mean, uh, synchronous way, uh, is difficult to supervise and uh, and to see how uh, learners are uh, are dealing with the uh, with the, with the kinesthetic work. It's uh, very difficult. Um, that's my point. Yeah, very interesting. Thank, thank you. And also Antonella from University of Salento in the chat. She's also saying that they are developing virtual and remote labs for engineering education. And they are promoting a fair approach to the use of their labs. Uh, I don't know, Kinaz uh, is asking Antonella if you want to, if you, should, you can tell a bit more about this lab. But in any case, I don't know, if, Antonella, if you if you want to, or if you're able to speak to present this. But in any case, uh, I think we can take note of this uh, subject of this issue as one issue for uh, collaboration within the subnetwork. So typically in the subnetwork, that's how it works. You know, an issue comes out, like in this case, and then uh, now we are doing it live. It's a, it's a luxury situation, but normally we can do it by mail or by through, through individual. Um, online discussions and uh, so it's, it's great to see this happening. Antonella? Yes, I'm here. Hello everyone, to everyone. Uh, um, hello, yes, Jasmine, I, we already are um, uh, cooperating for some virtual exchanges uh, um, modules, I hope so, for the next semester. And actually related to virtual online labs, um, uh, we are developing five uh, engineering uh, um, labs about uh, uh, mechanical and, and 3D printers. And we are using uh, an, uh, an approach based on uh, um, the video recording of several scenarios, which are uh, um, um, choreographed, composed, through um, uh, the simulation of experiment, including the experimental error. Um, uh, so in this way, once we have produced the lab, it can be reused and shared, so better supporting the equity and inclusion of uh, students, uh, both in Italy and abroad. And uh, what we are doing is uh, uh, treating this um, uh, piece of software, this application, as fair. So um, they will be um, available over the, the, the several repositories and maybe in some cases they will be open. But um, sometimes having everything open maybe is not the best uh, unique strategy, even if we are talking about open university and open science. If uh, you have any question, I'm available. We are just currently working on, on this. Oh, it, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, not only, there's a question by Kinaz, uh, if students could participate uh, remotely? Yes, they can. Uh, we, are, um, uh, we are simulating um, uh, several combinations of experiment and uh, according to the change of parameters uh, and uh, um, we add both an experimental error and uh, um, we, we show uh, through the video recordings what should uh, really happen 
if uh, they have chosen the, the right parameters, the proper parameters. Perfect, thank you very much. So I see this also from the messages in the chat as a potential area for, uh, for collaboration actually within- Yes, the definitely it could be uh, in several different uh, um, uh, um, scenarios in engineering there, in engineering topics. Perfect, yeah, thank you very much. Antonella, and the, I see very, very, I see yourself already as very active as one of the newest members of the, of the Sabonetto. So welcome and great to see you so active. So I think we're getting close to the end. Uh, I would like now to put on this uh, slide again to remind you the online resilience um, platform website that uh, we created within the Subnetwork. Actually, because we are, uh, we, we have been uh, discussing and wondering ourselves uh, what to do with all this uh, knowledge that we are gathering. Of course, it's there, it's available, and we are promoting it. Actually, the, the, this website has also inspired uh, another similar website uh, by the, um, I think, uh, the OER University or some other international development. So we are glad that uh, we, have, we have served as inspiration as an idea to collect the stories uh, from, the, from the pandemic, resi resilience stories. So actually we are collecting all this information and, uh, this, and, and discussing it like we did today. And we might be thinking of coming up with a publication, uh, asking some of you maybe to expand uh, a bit what you wrote. We could think of transforming this in a forum or in a, in a course, sorry, in an online collaborative course where we use uh, the different uh, ideas there and the different posts as learning nuggets. So we have this, uh, we have different ideas on the table and we need to see how to, how, to, how to bring this forward. For sure, we want to leave it open. And uh, so my, my first invitation is please uh, uh, continue posting your stories there as uh, some of you have done that and that's getting a very good visibility. I don't think we have the exact data, but that website is it's pretty visible on the web. And second, feel free to propose to us ideas uh, on whether you, how you see you could, uh, we could transform <clears throat> this, uh, this collection of ideas into something usable and, uh, and sustainable. <clears throat> so having said that, I think we're getting close to 12.30. I would like to ask the panelists uh, if you have uh, any last uh, uh, closing message to, for our, uh, Webinar. I see we have uh, Yasmin uh, proposing uh, to that we should move to offer online courses for the learning sub network about how, how to teach, uh, how to teach from a distance. Actually, this is something that the sub network is working on. Uh, as you've seen before, the link put on by Christina learn.unimed.net wants to be a sort of a collection place where we can collect courses dealing with this. And of course, uh, not only produced by, by us, the subnetwork itself cannot really produce things, but can facilitate uh, collaboration and emergency of things. So in, if you have some course that you want to suggest, feel free to suggest it to Christina or to myself and we can then put it in, the, in that platform. But that's a very good idea. So I'm, I'm tempted to give the, the floor to Wail uh, for the for a last closing word since you gave such a great opening. Wail, can I can I dare that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fabio. <laughs> uh, really, we've had a very rich morning, uh, and I want to thank you, Marcello, and of course Cristina for having organized this. Uh, We've talked about the challenges, we've talked about the practices, we've talked about the strategies of something that's very timely, that we are living in real time. And it's, uh, it's, it's always interesting to see what the reactions are, what the strategies adopted are, when the problem is in real time. So what we learned today, I'm sure for some of us, will be very useful in facing the challenges that uh, we're all facing now with uh, higher education and the COVID-19 uh, process. I'd like to share with you, maybe as a last thought before I close this, is the, uh, uh, and it's within the framework of the e-learning strategies for the future. Uh, e-learning strategies for the future, but again, e-learning in the framework of uh, uh, the next 
few years, the workplace, what's going to happen in the workplace, how to sustain this over time and so forth. And I just want to call attention to the fact that we are creating enormous amounts of information these days. Uh, I've read somewhere that uh, we produce every day uh, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. And that, that, if, if, if that's data, that, uh, uh, that's information, we are producing as much misinformation at the same time. And none of us really teach our students how to select between the information and the misinformation. So as we send all our students on the web, as we tell them that that's the place to go if they want to learn and to support and to write reports and so forth, I think we have to teach them somewhere in the curriculum how to evaluate sources and, and, and how to assess the information that they have uh, at, at, at their disposal. And at the same time, the updating of information, because as all of this piles up, uh, if, if you just go in at one level, at one, at, at, at one strata, you're picking information that may have been uh, outdated by something that came later. So there's a culture there that we have to pay attention to and that we have to inculcate in, our, in the minds of our students that yes, we are moving into a, a, a great, brave new world of information, but in that brave new world, they have to be very discerning and very careful about what they are using from, uh, from the thousands of, or the, the, the millions and millions of information, that, the data that they have. Thank you very much. That's uh, what I leave you with. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, very wise words, and at the same time, uh, I mean, words bringing us to a promising future. Actually, I, I, I have to say, a person like very much the, let's say, the the optimist view and the positive view, especially in terms of partnerships. I, I I'm, I'm a very big fan of looking at the private sector as an ally of both of public universities. So I think this is a, uh, the best way to go personally. So. I would like to thank everybody for the participation. Let me check, we are still 30 participants. So the group has been uh, keeping up uh, for one hour and a half. Uh, the recording of this webinar is gonna be made available on the Unimed website. And uh, so we are now uh, closing the recording and thanking you, but not before telling you uh, that uh, the next webinar of the Unimed week is taking place this afternoon at 3 p.m. Uh, Central European time, focusing on intercultural dialogue, which is uh, totally connected, is actually practically the same issue in some, in some sense uh, of, uh, of uh, opening up education through technology. So please feel free to keep on joining us uh, in, the next, uh, in the next appointment this afternoon. And uh, for the members of the subnetwork, we will have a number of other opportunities. We spoke about uh, proposing courses and resources, uh, promoting opportunities like the ones about Erasmus Plus virtual exchange and, uh, and seeing how to bring this discussion forward. So you will hear from us pretty soon. And in the meantime, thank you very much for your participation. And thank you also to all the speakers for this very rich uh, webinar and have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye.